and let's call this a uh, water commission meeting to order. Um, let's start with a roll call, please. Chair Keeney. Here. Vice Chair Snyder. Commissioner Keller. Here. Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Young. Council Liaison Sneddon. Here. Um, okay, do we have any changes to the agenda today? There are no changes to the agenda. Fantastic. Um, do we have any public comment? No public comment. Great. So let's get started with the consent items. Um, do we have any comments on the consent items for today? Nope. I, I move consent calendar. Great. Second. Have a vote, please. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Keller? Yes. Chair Cooney? Yes. Okay, so let's move on to the administrative items, starting with 6A, Design and Environmental Services for the Vic Trace Reservoir Replacement Project. There we go. Okay. Good morning, mm -hmm. Water Commission Chair Cooney, Commissioners, and Council Member Sneddon. My name is Kelly Bork. I'm a senior project engineer in the Water Resources Design Group, and I'm pleased this morning to present you with an update on the Victrace Reservoir Replacement Project. So today, or this morning, I'll be providing an update on the design, environmental, communication lessees on site, as well as outreach, and then providing um, brief updates on the timeline, budget, and next steps. I was here about a year ago, so we've done a lot of work in the last 12 months that we're excited to share. And the picture on the right is just to familiarize yourself with the location. Um, we're between, we're north of Cliff Drive, south of Carrillo Megs in the Mesa neighborhood. Vic Trace Reservoir, as a reminder, it's, it's one of our most critical facilities in the distribution system. It was built in the 1950s to store 10 million gallons of drinking water. So it's one of our largest reservoirs. And Cater Water Treatment Plant, it, it sends water two ways. So one way over to Sheffield in our higher zones and then the other way, the majority of water actually goes directly to Vic Trace and serves the downtown, the west side, the Mesa, and even the Hidden Valley neighborhoods. And in February, I had the pleasure of going to the site with Chair Cooney and Vice Chair Snyder, as well as um, Matt Ward and Joshua. We walked the site, but since then, we worked with City TV to get some drone footage of the site. Um, I thought this would be helpful because the, the topography is hard to see on Google Earth um, and it'll help describe some things today. So let's see if I can pull this up. It was kind of a gloomy day, <laughs> so maybe we'll be back when it's sunnier. Um, so before I hit play here, we're looking east towards uh, downtown in the pier. Um, this is the western southern slope of the property. And before I hit play, I just want to show, because it goes out of screen, is over to the left here, adjacent to Dolores. This is La Coronia Park. It's a public works owned, undeveloped neighborhood park. Um, but it is contiguous with the 15 acres of the property, and we'll be looking at that during the design process. So let's fly over. Um, so this slope in front of us is what we're going to look at may maybe for solar. Um, we'll see about that, and I'll speak to that in a couple slides. But to the north here, you'll see that this is really steep. Um, and then this is our existing driveway to the site, also very steep for construction vehicles and even for our own operators. Also, we have some trees around and, and about 20 homes that back up the site. So that'll be important during outreach. And then lastly, this is the communications facility area. I'll pause there before we <laughs> fly over some homes. This is that area that's been there for about 20, 30 years um, with some private party radio facilities on site. Mm. 
This one, Leah? No, we don't want to end. That one? Uh, no. Nope. <laughs> there we go. Wonderful. No, no worries. Okay, so let's dive into the project. Um, so I'll speak first to design. Um, since we saw you last, we've engaged um, state, local, national engineering firms to get excited about our project. We brought them to the site, um, answered their questions, and also received a lot of feedback, which was great. We incorporated some of that into a request for proposals that we issued last fall. We received five really strong proposals, evaluated them um, with a team of both engineering and water resources. We interviewed several of those firms in person here at the city and then conducted some follow-up interviews, um, I believe January and February of this year. And we're excited to share that we've selected Kennedy Jenks to be our design partner on this project. Kennedy Jenks has done several, several projects with the city, which is really great. They're familiar with our team. They're a water resources design firm. They've been around for 100 years. And the font here is really small in the figure, but it's just to show how many reservoir replacement projects they've done in California. So we'll have a lot of lessons learned from them. Reservoirs are typically on hilltops, in neighborhoods, um, so they'll, they'll bring a lot of expertise in that regard. They've also worked with Rincon and CATS, our other partners on this project, um, and they bring a deep bench of set specialties, up to 30 different folks, um, to complete this design. And the last thing I'll mention is this rendering and visioning materials. This project will be one of the first where engineering can really, and water, can leverage 3D flyovers and really um, engaging visioning materials, not just for the community, but also even for our operators, for how we're going to drive on site, how we're going to get in the vault. So we're really looking forward to that. Some of the design components they'll be helping us with are, first and foremost, the replacement of the reservoir. But they'll also be looking at improved access to the site, construction routes in and around the neighborhood, better landscaping, um, new drainage systems, and I guess improving the topography of the site to work better for us. And then also just looking to the future, um, how we can optimize the site for whether it be renewable energy or, or some facilities that could help out water resources. So this illustration is just to show kind of the path Kennedy Jenks is going to take us through over the next two, two years or so. They'll get up to speed with data collection on the project. And one of their first tasks will be an alternatives analysis. So they're going to work with us to think about maybe five different layouts for the site um, that sort of look, look or trend in different directions, maybe renewable energy versus others. And then simultaneous to that, um, Kennedy Jenks brings a really great grants and funding expertise that we found really valuable. They're going to be identifying which funding avenues we're going to be most competitive for. That will culminate into a PDR, a preliminary design report, which will hopefully narrow down maybe two to three different site layouts that we're interested in. And that will be the vehicle that we'll start taking to other city departments, the community, hopefully a community design workshop to solicit feedback. Once we coalesce around one or so um, layouts, then we'll kick off the community development and planning commission review and what we anticipate to be a CEQA EIR process, which I'll speak to in a couple slides. And that'll get us to final design. This timeline is pretty similar to what I showed you about a year ago. It shows where we are today in 2024 and going out through about 2030. Um, so today in design, we're in preliminary design. In 2025 and 26, we'll do final design. Environmental, we, we've done a lot of work over the last 12 months. And with the contract going to city council in May, we'll kick off the CEQA EIR process. 
for outreach. We're in the middle of planning, and then we'll keep them on board, hopefully, to solicit design and construction impact feedback over the next year or two. And hope to be constructing maybe in 2027, 2028. All right. So other things that we've been working on are environmental studies. We completed a phase one environmental review last year with Rincon. Um, we had them look at biological, cultural, and environmental resources. Um, and I'll speak briefly to some of those findings. They are pretty minor. Biological, um, typical construction-related biological mitigation expected, like nesting birds working around the trees that are up there at the site um, that are mostly eucalyptus. Um, for cultural, no cultural findings on the site itself, but thankfully we had Rincon look at some off-site areas where we're doing pipeline and valve work, and they did find one resource, so we'll keep that in mind when we go through design. And then lastly, I couldn't remember if we spoke to this last year, but for environmental, there is an existing oil well on site. It was drilled in the 1930s, um, 1,500 feet deep. It was abandoned properly in the 1930s, but maybe not to today's standards. Um, so that will be addressed kind of as, a, as an if-then. If we demolish the reservoir, then we'll get in there. We'll look and see if the soil's contaminated with any oil from the 1930s and, and mitigate it appropriately. Um, so with that said, even though there's no major red flags that we found so far, just the extent of the construction impacts and the length of this project. Rincon's recommending an EIR for this project, but that, that'll help us too, because a lot of funding avenues now to require some tight environmental. Um, so that'll kind of put our best foot forward um, for this project, and that'll kick off this summer and should be complete um, spring of 2026. There, um, there are several private and public communication lessees on the site in that area I showed. Um, they're listed here, the county, SoCal Gas, uh, Radio Club, and Crown Castle, which is a um, cellular like dish in AT&T. We, um, in anticipation of this project and what's kind of typical for a project of this scale, we want a clean slate so um, we can coordinate construction in and around these facilities and also um, just see if we can get them to relocate sooner rather than rushing to do it during construction. So we've been in conversations with them over the past year, but we formally notified them in January of the need to vacate and relocate the site. Um, so all of them are in process of doing that, which is great, and we can revisit the future of communication facilities after this project is over. For outreach, we've been working with Cats and Associates, which have been, I believe they've been working on your rates, which has been a really great relationship. We've taken a lot of that feedback in hopes of carrying that along through the VicTrace project. Um, they've developed multiple different materials for us, but what we're excited to share is they're about to kick off a stakeholder, like one-on-one -on -one interview process with about a, a dozen folks um, over the next couple months. Those include elected officials like Mayor Randy Rouse, Councilmember Jordan, Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Um, Commissioner Davis is identified at the moment due to his expertise on planning, commission, and community development too. Um, community groups like um, business associations, neighborhood associations, as well as community environmental council, as well as some neighbors in the area that we wanna engage sooner than later. And the next time we would approach the public would hopefully be with our preliminary design later this year or early, early in 2025. So this is fun stuff we've worked on. We developed a logo shown here, a draft logo, and we've also put together a website um, similar to other city projects where residents or those who are interested can start subscribing for updates. As for budget, this table was presented last year. It's been pretty much unchanged. The large 
$35 million number is for construction. That was based on a 2019 estimate, and it's been included in Kennedy Jenks design scope to be almost continuously giving us cost figures so that we're not surprised when we go out to construction. And with that, just some next steps to round out the presentation. We'll be conducting stakeholder interviews over the next several months. We'll also be hitting some critical funding deadlines that are in the fall of this year for the state revolving fund and BRIC, which is FEMA's um, national funding application. Then we'll be doing the alternatives analysis and preliminary design that I spoke to, um, which will be really exciting. And lastly, maybe by the end of this year, early next year, we'll be approaching the public to receive some community feedback. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, very, very clear. A couple of questions. The first one is kind of, uh, so we need to replace it, but it seems that there's not an urgency. So we have a five time, is that correct? That it's, it's something that you know, we don't have an immediate issue going on. We have, <laughs> how do I put this? Um, there is some urgency. The roof really needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. is a significant corrosion in, inside. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> our water operations team have been on the roof to seal some of the mm -hmm. corrosion that's occurring, mm -hmm. so we believe we're keeping, but there is, those patches aren't going to last forever, mm -hmm. and so really wanting to keep this moving, but as you noted, this moving quickly is completion <laughs> in 2030. 2029, Somewhere in there. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, in the meantime, this is a critical reservoir. What's kind of our plan as we're constructing and, you know, uh, destructing yeah. and... The plan for construction, you mean like, we're going to take the tank offline. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So we have to have some backup or something. No? Yeah, so um, water did a distribution infrastructure plan a couple years ago. And mm -hmm. one of the things they modeled was if they could take the tank fully offline. And so long as the cater resiliency project, which mm -hmm. is adding about a million or two mm -hmm. in storage, mm -hmm. so long as that comes online, we can take this tank completely offline. Okay. Um, and if we do decide to build two tanks, we could build one ahead of the other, mm -hmm. bring that online before the second one. Okay. And you also, sorry, you also mentioned the Cornelia Park, that's uh, something about it when you're doing the video, but we didn't, I didn't see anything here. So what's happening there? It's, we don't know yet. Oh, okay. It's being considered in our design um, if we'd like to do something there or not, either with construction routes, a permanent new driveway instead of that mm -hmm. narrow driveway that's through an easement next to someone's home. So it, it's kind of open-ended at the moment. Yeah, so the park, it was, you can, when you're out there, it basically is two building pads. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the developer donated or, or what the whole story was with it. Um, but yeah, it's it's currently not really even accessible to the community. There's no path, especially no ADA pathway. I mean, it's difficult even on two feet to get to the bulk of that space. Um, and preliminary discussion with parks, they don't want it. They don't have any money for it. They have, we have enough in their minds, we have enough parks that we can't maintain the parks we already have. And so trying to figure out what, what is the right usage of this, the space doesn't appear to be used by the community, um, but um, trying to figure out what that looks like, because it, um, it did get approved as some type of... Yeah, it was in, when we did all the zoning rules and regulations, it was included on that list. Um, so it is zoned as in a neighborhood park. Yeah, but it definitely looks aggressively unused. Yeah. Like it's not just like it, there's obvious there's no obvious like walking past. It's very the ground is super uneven. Mm -hmm. It's kind of I think it was maybe a little muddy when we were there. So it was mm -hmm. like if you step the wrong way, your foot sinks in mm -hmm. kind of thing. So you're like no one's hanging yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had two kind of follow ups. Both. I'll go to that one first. So is the use of that property part of our process? When we're going to the community, are we going out there basically looking at what's a land use issue as well as the replacement issue? I think that's going to be yeah part of the conversation of you know this this space isn't currently used, but is there something that could could work better for that community? Um, and, and the reason the reason I ask again, just going back to zoning, was it's a park property, 
Therefore, if you wanted to use it for something else, you'd have to have a vote of the people in order to use it for something else. So that, that's just a bigger issue. And I just, my question just was more of a land use issue. Is this, when we go to the community, they're going to say, what are you doing with that? And yeah. what's, you know, again, it will be a further discussion, but just raise the question in that regard. Yeah. No, it is a unique one. It doesn't fall under the same um, yeah. approval and, you know, process I, that our parks went through. So yeah. that's kind of a weird, I mean, it's a continuous parcel with the Victory's parcel. It says it's not a separate parcel, and then it's deemed a public works park, which is, an, anyway, every part about it is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it almost seemed like it was someone's pet project that it got put in this way, not necessarily a... There, there, there were other remnant parcels like that, at least in my tenure, that we've had to go to the ballot. And actually, people said, yeah, we understand. It's, it's time it's to changed. move on. So yeah. uh, and anyway, I think Matt had a question or a comment. Yeah, just a couple of uh, general comments on, on that. There's, there's some existing drainage there that's critical to the facility that's, that's already there. But a lot to sort out on, on this, this matter as we go through the, the process, a very transparent process with the community about what we're gonna do there. Also, just speaking to the importance of the reservoir, um, as you're aware, it's a gravity-fed reservoir, so it's extremely efficient. Um, the, the age and the current condition of it are requiring um, immediate kind of action, and so that's why we started early on this project with the planning, and we've been working really, Kelly's been working very closely with the project team to identify how operationally we're gonna go about all of this. So we'll be using all of our other distribution facilities to make sure that we can supply water continuously under all, all circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, because actually that was my other question and that was the pressure zone questions relative to taking this off, which is gravity fed on top of the hill, what happens to the system, the immediate system, that'll all work out in terms of the, the plan going forward. But that was my other question taking a gravity-fed major reservoir offline, now what are you gonna do relative to, to service in the immediate area? So yeah, all good questions. Thank you. Any, any public comment? No public comment. Madam okay. Chair, I, I, I move staff recommendations. Second. Let's have a vote. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Keller? Yes. Chair Cooney? Yes. Thank you. And, th and thank you for the information on the environmental review. I, I, I appreciate that. So we'll move on to administrative item 6B, the administrative guidelines for extraordinary water use billing adjustments. Good morning, Chair Cooney, Water Commissioners, and Council Member Snedden. My name is Dakota Corey, and I'm the Water Supply and Services Manager for the city. And I'm here just to tee up this presentation. Ms. Wood is going to um, lead you through it. But I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. For several years, the city has had an extraordinary water use billing adjustment program, often referred to as leak relief. So this is when customers have unexplained usage um, that they demonstrate that they've fixed, often a leak. Um, we can provide a billing adjustment to help them uh, absorb some of the cost um, associated with that leak. Um, there's a lot of parameters and guidelines that go into how we administer that program. It is administered by our finance department, um, but obviously we have to have close coordination with water resources. So um, we're proposing some changes to this program, and this is driven by our implementation of our advanced metering infrastructure program. Now that our customers have real-time data and access to their water usage, um, the opportunity to detect a leak much earlier than they have in the past exists, and we're hoping to use some changes to this program to incentivize people to be even more actively in control and managing their own water use. So that's really what we're going to walk you through today. Um, Ms. Wood will give our presentation, but I also wanted to mention that we have our assistant finance director, Lindsay Maas, here today, and our finance supervisor, Yesenia, and um, they are also here to answer questions as needed. All right, Chair Cooney, uh, members of the commission, my name is Madeline Wood. I'm the water conservation analyst, and I will be talking you through the updates to our administrative guidelines. 
So as Ms. Corey said, this is an existing program that grants billing adjustments to our water customers who experience abnormally high water use. And previously, and for uh, since the dawn of time of billing, um, most customers were not aware of their leak until they had a monthly meter read. Uh, we did have several programs um, to try to alert them at, the, at that time, you know, door hangers, phone calls, et cetera, letters. But again, usually 30 days had gone by um, when they were getting these notifications, which could have um, a, a big impact on their water bill. And so having a program like this has been a great success um, in lowering customers' costs and also building rapport and trust in high regard with our, our customers. So this leak relief program, as Ms. Corey said, it's administered by the finance department. Um, it was previously outlined in our schedule of fees, penalties, and service charges, which is commonly called the fee resolution. Um, but we've been given direction from the city attorney's office to have it adopted as a separate policy. So that's why the admin guidelines have a little yellow X's. Um, that's something to come in May or June where we'll take it to council as a separate policy and pull it out of the fee resolution. Um, as an overview, these are granted for circumstances that are beyond what can be reasonably expected of the customer. And as we know, leaks are often silent, they're often hidden, um, and they can also escalate quickly. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real cascade of, of uh, ill effects there. Um, but they are not granted for intentional water use. You know, sometimes people will need to fill their swimming pool or they establish some new landscaping and they can be expected to have high water usage. That is when this is, isn't appropriate and they won't be granted for those voluntary uses of water. Also to note, the um, billing adjustment does not give free water. We're not able to do that, but what we can do is reduce the charges to the tier one charge. And just some um, stats about the adjustment. So this is for last calendar year, 2023. The number of approved requ requests was 637. The total amount of the approved requests was $689,623,000. Um, the average amount was a little over $1,000. And you'll see the breakdown of the causes here. Most of them were leaks. Um, a por portion were water line breaks or broken pipes. Those are usually what we call something like a burst leak, where it's a large volume of water all at once. We had 19 in unexplained, which I'll go into a little bit, and then three as documented water theft. And the unexplained water usage is something that's outlined in the, the administrative guidelines, where we've had cases that um, are hard for everyone. <laughs> They're hard for us and the customer where they have exceptionally high water use and they try all their might and we try to understand what happened and we just can't figure it out. Sometimes it just goes down a gopher hole, it goes down the sewer, there's just no way that we can figure it out. Something was on the fritz and it fixed itself. And so we do have a process in which they can document all the steps that they took, utilizing our resources, use, utilizing plumbers, irrigation techs, et cetera. And if they have these extraordinary high water uses um, and they document everything that they did to try to ameliorate that, that's something that we've been able to build into our program. And hopefully there are less of those with AMI. <laughs> um, and as... A caveat to this, um, for calendar year 2024, the finance department has already seen less applications come in. So as you know, with the AMI, we rolled it out in batches starting in last fall. And so for 2024, even though we didn't launch until a month ago, some of our customers had already been on it in the pilot in the various batches. And so they're already seeing less applications come in, um, which is a great success. So now with automated metering infrastructure, we have a lot more tools at our fingertips, as do our customers. So our customer portal officially launched on March 11th, so we're five weeks in now. And what we have is the ability to send messages, send emails to customers to notify them of water usage every hour. And our customers are opted into that program. Oops. 
Sorry, Scott, I'm not joining that meeting. Okay, so the, um, uh, the ability for customers to get notified is much more enhanced and we're also have more tools at our fingertips. And so even if we don't have someone's email address, we're calling them, we're generating lists of our highest um, leaks, and we're taking that extra step to try to notify them as well. And then one of the great things that WaterSmart has is what's called a leak resolution guide. So not only do we say, you may have a leak, but it'll t talk them through, like on their phone or on their computer. OK, first check here, because it's almost always toilets. Okay. First, this is how you check your toilets. Now let's go to your irrigation timer. And it'll talk them through how to find it. And then they can provide feedback to us through that same format. And so every day we get these leak resolution emails saying, I found it, it was in the toilet. They can note what it was or you know, just sort of verbatim give us some feedback. So I pulled up um, a recent one. Uh -oh. oh, because I clicked on Scott's thing. OK, there we go. Um, so this is from a recent customer. So lucky you helped us catch that leak. I had no idea the toilet was still filling up. I adjusted the settings and we'll double check later today. So people are able to fix the issues um, very quickly and hopefully keep their water charges down. So to go through the proposed changes um, on the screen here, these are the ones that we are proposing to modify due to our new AMI technology. So since we have all these wonderful new programs to catch leaks, we are encouraging our customers to take advantage of these programs. So if a customer has opted out of the AMI program, that means they've had a um, application submitted to remove what's called the meter transmitting unit. Um, they are not eligible for billing adjustments. And this is very clear on that application. If you are opting out of this entire technology, so that means the city, we can't even tell if you have an hourly leak because we will be doing uh, manual meter reads and manual bills for these people. They're not eligible for the billing adjustments and they certify that they understand that when they fill out the application. Um, so that's one category. The other two bullet points are people who do have an MTU, so they have not opted out. But for everyone else, to receive the adjustment, you need to be registered for WaterSmart. You don't need to have been at the time of the leak. You can do it retroactively, but before we grant that billing adjustment on their account, we need, we'll talk them through it, but they do need to register for WaterSmart. And the same thing with the leak alert subscription. They can't be unsubscribed from those leak alerts. And we'll, of course, make some um, adjustments for folks who don't have access to technology, um, we will work with them. But by and large, we want people to be using the tools that we have now. And then we have two other proposed changes, and this was simply because we were changing the administrative guidelines and we found a couple other opportunities to really streamline things. So the calculation of the volume of the extraordinary water use charges has been simplified. It used to be um, a comparison of six months usage from the previous year, and now we're just making it simple. It's just the average of the previous 12 months. Um, and then also, for a time, we were granting second billing adjustments if the customer had rescinded the first, and now we're going back to just one every five years to simplify that process as well. So our recommended our recommendation today is that the Water Commission review the administrative guidelines and then direct the Public Works Director and Finance Director to sign and implement these new guidelines upon the policy being adopted by Council. And we're here for any questions and feedback. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, well, let's just start with a comment. I really like the proposed changes off the top. Great. Great idea. Um, on the opted out, I, I just raised a couple questions for me. Um, why would people opt out, number one? Is this like the smart meter question that Edison had? Uh, yeah, he shakes his head yes. Um, and does the AMI program have anything to do with our electronic billing so that what happens if people opt out and billing? Great question. So Commissioner Davis, um, the reasons uh, can be varied, but 
it does entail that it's a manual read, so rolling a truck out every month and a manual billing process as well. And so right now we currently don't have anyone technically opted out, but it's because we've been, as we hear from customers um, that do not, that are not interested in the program, um, we have added them to a list. We have about 12 of them. And this next phase is talking to them to see which portion and sort of how much are they not interested in it. Because we know some people will just never register for WaterSmart. They don't care about it. They don't want to see see the emails, et cetera. But there, we assume there will be a small handful, just talking to other utilities as well, who opt out of all um, smart metering technology. We do see on the, on the list someone said, I've already opted out of SoCal Gas and Edison. Most likely they will opt out of this too. And it could be for varied reasons. Um, we do have on our website a lot of um, frequently asked questions specific to radio frequencies about um, data and um, data protection, et cetera. But people, they have their own reasons. And so if they feel more comfortable with the manual reads, um, we do have a process for them. They do have a monthly payment that they need to make. It's a fee yeah, for that good. special uh, manual reading and manual billing because that's an additional process that the city takes on. Yeah, you read my mind. That was my next question. So thank you. Thank you for that. But these were all of my questions. Yeah. Too. <laughs> and I'll just tell you, AMI, it, for me, I've had a, a toilet leak and bam, it popped mm -hmm. up right away. It really works. And so mm -hmm. I could see over time it will be a very effective program. Excellent. Any more questions or comments? from please so are we officially out of the pilot period of time now everybody's in and unless you opt out everyone's in that's correct mm -hmm. congratulations and just a comment on um i really appreciate your slides um they were appropriate but you also had women holding wrenches and um <laughs> different, uh, the, the money just pouring out of the tap there. I just really appreciated them. Thank you. And I just wanted to quickly mention that we will be coming back to Water Commission next month with an AMI update, so we'll have an overview of the program. Um, just as a teaser, we've had a really significant um, uptake of the process, and we're at, I believe it's over 34% of our customers now are enrolled in WaterSmart. So we're having a lot of success getting people signed up. But we'll have more to share next month. Our goal was 20%. Just, oh, 10, 10. Just based on what other communities saw in their first mm -hmm. year. So we're oh, definitely right. seeing a lot more participation than most communities, which is fantastic. Great. Great. And do we have any public comment? No public comment. Fantastic. So I move that the Water Commission review and confirm the administrative guidance for extraordinary water use billing adjustments. Second. Can we have a vote, please? Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Keller? Yes. Chair Cooney? Yes. Okay, so let's move on to the Water Resources Manager's Report, please. All right, thank you. Um, so I want to start out, um, if you guys have had a chance to look at it and you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to speak to those. But I just had some items I wanted to touch on. So we are currently dealing with three landslides in town that are threatening water and wastewater facilities. We have one on West Mountain, which has taken a good chunk out of the road. Um, we have a 12 inch water main up there that is uh, at risk. And uh, right now our streets engineering group is taking the lead with trying to reconstruct the road. Um, we have one on Los Alturas that we're working with. Uh, it has crushed the sewer main and we've now uh, have installed pumps to pump around the slide. Um, and that has been a huge effort by our engineering and collections team to make that happen. And then we have a more recent one that just showed up on Barker Pass, which is in the county, but it's within our water service area. And the one on Barker Pass, we actually have two water mains, two different pressure zones. Um, and so um, we're working with the county on that. Um, fascinating to go up there right now. There's just springs everywhere there's water coming out of a hillside i mean it's just it's really remarkable so trying to work with the county on um we've now tested and 
can temporarily shut down these lines, have the county reconstruct it, but it, it looks to be part of a much larger land movement. So we'll we'll see where that takes us. But certainly taking a lot of staff resources uh, to coordinate all of these uh, responses and come up with short term and now long term. Uh, and then of course, we're gonna be at some point having to clean this up by going to our reserves to, you know, the actual costs of these. Right now, they're probably on the order of magnitude of hundreds of thousands, but we'll see how much the permanent solution will require. So, um, I think I'd sent this out, but Commissioner Cora had her baby on March 28th. Um, and so we're super excited for her and her family. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see, moving on, we did get approval from the council to send out rate notices. Those will go out April 24th, um, start going out, I should say, April 24th. Um, good conversation there. There was concerns about reserves. There's a bigger topic going on here, but Councilmember Harmon has an interest in lowering the city's reserves on hand. And as you may recall, we did go through a pretty extensive process to look at our reserves. Like I too, that's a lot of money sitting there, had concerns. But when we went through, I found out that we were actually on the lower side. We weren't uh, the agency. I thought I thought we had pretty good stockpile. We have about five months worth of cash on hand should we run into emergencies. Um, I'd say triple A rated, triple A rated agencies have a year or more. Um, so. Um, and, and a lot of the conversation, which is tough, is every community has different risks. And I think that goes into that discussion as well. Uh, for example, Fresno, very different risk profile than here. We've got our wildfires, we've got our flooding, our landslides, tsunamis. I think we've pretty much got them all, including the pandemic. Um, yeah, but I mean, just we, we have uh, certainly a lot more risks than some communities do and as a result needing to make sure that you have the resources to be able to at least step in temporarily and keep keep services going um and then i'll finally close out here with water science advisory council i got myself on the ventura ventura college water yeah water science advisory council fantastic it's a group of about 10 10 agencies and went over the curriculum. They've got a really great program there. I'm hoping we can get that program brought to Santa Barbara City College, uh, if not uh, some type of um, collaboration, um, because it's really exciting. They've got a great list of classes. They're talking about um, also interviewing classes for advanced water treatment. So really not only getting people into the industry, but then also taking the ones that are working the industry and, and really helping them to upskill so really excited to be part of that and and like i said hoping we can bring it home to santa barbara county as well because uh, i think there's a lot of value to that for us um and with that is there any questions in the report here otherwise um, that concludes my comments when will we stop the rings <laughs> <laughs> i've requested uh, uh that's, Cease and desist for now. <laughs> no more uh, seating of the clouds, okay? <laughs> we did. We we opted out of cloud seating again this year. Yeah. I, I'm okay with the rain. I just want it on like a Wednesday instead of Saturday. Yeah. Well, we've got enough rain. That's, so. that's enough for this year. I love that we get to joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get used to it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, if we don't have any comments from the commission, we don't have any public comment then let's call this meeting to a close and we will be back here. I've lost my paper uh, in May. May 16th. May 16th. Thank you so much. See you back here at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.